The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 193. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Andy Bounds, author of Top Dog, Impress and Influence Everyone You Meet. Welcome, Andy, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Wait, thank you. Before we take a deep dive into your book, Top Dog, will you take just a moment to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally? Sure. Um, so my name is Andy Bounds. I, I'm one of the two authors of Top Dog. Um, the other one is Richard Ruttle, a very successful practitioner in a large um, multinational accountancy practice. Um, I myself have my own consultancy practice. And what I do is I help large organizations to, well, basically to sell more. Um, I've worked in 30 countries. Um, Top Dog is my third book. Um, and my insights into communication stem a lot from my family background, Wade. My mother's actually blind, so the person who taught me to speak can't see, which I guess has helped me become very good at explaining things. And hopefully that's one of the things that readers of Top Dog will get. They'll be able to read it and understand exactly what they need to do to progress their business. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And now let's jump right into the book that you just mentioned, Top Dog, Impress and Influence Everyone You Meet, uh, which was just made available not that long ago, actually March 23rd, 2015. And Andy, we're going to move quickly, but our whole goal here today is to cover the top questions that our listener slash future reader would like to get answered. And that first question is, what was the inspiration behind writing Top Dog? Okay, well, the inspiration was to help people in conversations when they think the other person is more important than them. You know, when you go for a job interview, you think the interviewer is more important than you. When you go to a customer, often you think the customer is more important than you because they hold the budget. When you talk to your boss, you think the boss is more important than you. And we all talk with people all the time who we think are more important, if you like, the top dog. Now, the trouble is when we talk about um, when we talk with these very important people, it's easy to be too deferential with them. In other words, we don't come across ourselves as a top dog. We say things like, thank you so much for sparing the time because I know how busy you are. We think that sounds polite, but actually we're really saying we think you're more important than us. Um, and then at the end, when someone says, um, oh, you know, um, give me a call when you're ready, you say, yes, certainly. Thank you very much. And we leave. And all these things, they're transmitting these unseen messages. The other person holds the power. Now, when this happens, one of two negative things tends to happen. Either we don't get what we want at all, so we don't get the job, we don't get the sale, we don't get what we ask the boss for, or we do get a bit of what we want, but not as much as we wanted. So we get the job, but it's not quite as advertised, or we get the sale, but we have to drop our price. So the inspiration for this book is to just get rid of all that frustration out there that so many entrepreneurs feel that every time I have a conversation with these important people, it's not going as well as I want. This book will make sure that it does. So you just talked about the entrepreneurs and, and those different conversations, and now we want to help you differentiate your book. And so we're asking, what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? I was thinking about this. Uh, there's three things really, Wade. Uh, firstly, it works pretty much instantly. You know, I've already had feedback from people who bought the book just two or three days ago who said, I read it, I did what you said, and already I've got the next meeting with a customer. Or I did what you said, and I've got someone to see me when they previously wouldn't. So the returns are almost instant. I mean, how many business books can you say that about? We often learn great things, but then we have to think how to apply it to our business. This book isn't like that. You read a page and just use it straight away. Um, secondly, as I said before, Richard, my co-author, and I have two very different slants. He works inside a large organization, and I have my own consultancy and work outside large organizations. And having both the inside and the outside helps us see things from both points of view. So you get two different perspectives in the book. And the third one, which is um, quite a nice analogy we use, Richard has um, bred dogs all his life and researched a lot about um, pack behavior you see in dogs and about top dogs and submissive dogs and so on. And so it's, it's not something we talk about a lot in the book, but there's a couple of things we say how we can learn from, our, uh, from other animals about ways that you can become top dogs. So if you happen to love dogs, great. You'll like the analogy. If you're not bothered about dogs, it's only a handful of lines in the book, but it just helps us see that we're animals ourselves and we sometimes copy what we see other animals do. 
So Andy, this question might be a little bit different because I'm asking you, how do you, you know, how do you suggest the reader engage with your book? Is this a book that you wrote uh, and they can jump in and jump out cherry picking information as needed? Or did you really design it to be read from front to back? Yeah, great question, Wade. We designed it as the former so people can read it as they like. So when we set the contents up, we we know that people who read our book are very busy. And I don't know about you, but there are times I've read business books cover to cover, but quite rare, really. I'm a busy guy. I'm a successful guy. I want to read the content, see the chapter I want, go straight in there. And I hate it when chapters say, as you saw four pages ago, da, 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 because then it means the chapter isn't self-contained. All our chapters are self-contained. So if I just run through some of the things in, that we cover in the chapters, if you like, the contents page to give you an idea of the sort of things that we cover, but to reinforce the point, people can dip in and out as they want. So what we did is we quite like the dog analogy. So we started off by um, calling the first chapter Lead the Pack. In other words, focus on other people's successes, not your own. In other words, be the top dog yourself. And um, the next chapter is all about drop. You know, when you say to a dog, drop. Um, well, this is unlearn the bad habits that hold you back. If you look at the way we're made up as humans, basically, our brain likes to automate. It seeks out habits. And it's a good job it does, because if it didn't, every single morning when you picked up your toothpaste, you'd think, how do I brush my teeth again? You know, your brain is looking to automate all the time, because that way, if it automates all the time, it can concentrate on clever stuff. Now, why is this relevant? Because without realizing it, we're all creatures of habit. I mean, we all know people who wanted to lose weight, but the trouble is Sunday night's pizza night, and they have trouble breaking that habit. We all know people who've wanted to give up smoking, but the fact is it's just nice to have a cigarette after dinner or whatever whatever they think. And also, when we go into meetings, we're creatures of habit. We tend to be in this meeting as we were in the previous meeting, even if it didn't work last time. So we start off very early with simple ways that you can unpick what you do. None of this theoretical stuff you look at and think, I need to think about this for weeks, but very, very simple things you can look at and use instantly to help you change your habits. From that, we then start having a look at making a great first impression. We call this the welcome visitor. You know when you go in and some dogs are quite nice and friendly and some humans are quite nice and friendly? Well, how you make a great first impression as entrepreneurs, we have so many meetings with new people that we do more first impressions than virtually anybody else. And we all know how important first impressions are. We all know you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So why is it that when people go into all these meetings, they very rarely practice their first impression? They don't know the first sentence that's going to come out of their mouth. And therefore, just like cleaning your teeth, you kind of use the same sentence you did yesterday. So we show you how to create a very good first impression. And as you know, if you start off well, people have this wonderful first impression and it lasts a long time. You know, almost if you're not very good, it takes them a while to realize. But going the other way, if you start off in a very boring way, what you tend to find is they think that probably you are boring and it takes them a while to realize you aren't. I mean, a simple thing with this is when we talk about elevator pitches, you know how you introduce yourself in a sentence. Very often people introduce themselves by talking about what they are. So I might say, I'm a consultant, because I am. And people will look at me and say, between jobs are you? Because they have this preconception about what consultants make. But if I talk about what I call the afters, in other words, why is the other person better off after working with me? All of a sudden, I don't talk about what I am, a consultant. Instead, I talk about what happens after I finish. So I say things like, well, I help companies sell more than they thought they could. And believe me, nobody says between jobs, are you? They say, what do you mean? Or I bet you're busy. Or who do you do that for? Or what we could do with that. So just things like practicing how you introduce yourself sets the tone for everything. I mean, would you rather speak to a CPA or someone who can slash your tax bill? Would you rather speak to a lawyer or someone who can keep you out of jail? So the book talks about how to give a good first impression, how to do an icebreaker so the other person loves you very quickly, but also what not to do. So we don't want to do this deferential beta dog thing where we say, thanks so much for sparing the time. And at the end, we don't want to say, I'm really grateful you saw me today. So we talk about how we can do this great first impression. So we come across as a top dog from sentence one. From that, we then talk about how to get and then prepare for great first meetings. We call this pick up the lead, and the next chapter is called walkies. So how do we get meetings? How do we prepare for meetings? And how do we deliver a great first meeting? Um, now, this is often the opposite of what people do. 
Um, I don't know about you, but if I was going to catch up with someone I haven't seen for a while, I wouldn't go into a coffee shop and say, I haven't seen you for a while, so I thought I'd prepare a 50-slide deck about what's going on in my life and what I imagine is happening in yours. I mean, people just don't do things like that, but yet in business often we do. And entrepreneurs are passionate about their business, and what they tend to do if they're not careful is talk too much about their business. Now, that's wonderful that you have the passion, but you see, when I woke up, I wasn't passionate about your business. I was passionate about mine. So it's so important that we do the right thing in the meetings so people straight away go, oh, you're interesting. Tell me a bit more about that. And so then we talk about that in the meeting. Now, assuming that's gone really well, there's then going to be a second meeting. So we have a chapter called Keep Walking, which is how you build momentum in subsequent meetings. And eventually, of course, if that goes well, they're going to say, let's get a proposal in place. You know, or if you're going for a job interview, they might say, can you write me a short resume on this? Um, maybe your boss says, I'm happy to consider a pay rise, write a short report on a business case, why I should give you more money and so on. So the next two chapters talk about proposals and presentations. In other words, how can you write down a persuasive business case and then how can you present a persuasive business case? And in my experience of working with I don't know, tens of thousands of people over the years, proposals and presentations cause more pain than anything. The number of people who say it was going all right until I sent the proposal and then I never heard back or the customer said they'd ring me back on Wednesday and then they didn't. And then I had to think, do I chase them and feel I'm pestering or do I leave it and feel impotent? I didn't know what to do, so I didn't do anything and it sort of fizzled out. So my three months I'd invested just led to nothing. So we talk about how to write proposals. In that chapter, there's a very simple template that people can just copy and paste their relevant phrases in so they can use our chapter to help them write a proposal. This proposal has worked in all the different countries I've worked in. It's very, very powerful. It works in different sectors. And when people look at it, they just feel very comfortable. They can write a proposal, A, quickly, B, persuasively, and C, that leads to next steps. And something that we talk about in the book, actually, is never send a proposal and wait for the customer to ring back. When you send the proposal, you say, OK, so the two next steps are this. I'll send a proposal for you, have a look at it. And of course, the second step after that is we have a chat to discuss it. When do you think we might be able to do that? How long do you want to leave it before we talk again? And so in effect, before you even send the proposal, you say we're talking again afterwards. And what that does is it just as a top dog would do, keeps you in control of the process rather than hoping to high heck that they ring you back next week. We then have a chapter on presentations. Actually, this is where I first got into my business by helping people with presentations. Uh, marketing, um, what do you call him? Uh, guru, legend, Drayton Bird used to um, work with David Ogilvy and so on. Serious, serious guy. Um, it gave me a wonderful compliment. He said, I taught him more about effective presenting than the lady who had previously taught two American presidents. That was his previous coach. So I know an awful lot about presentations. If anything, this is my real sweet spot. So we talk a lot about things like how to be interesting, how to start, how to make sure straight away people think, oh, this is a top dog, not someone who um, is trying desperately to win the work and so on. And then the final chapter is called Stay Top Dog. And the reason we put this in, Wade, is it's very easy, I think, in business to hear good ideas. And in the book, it's so easy to act on this stuff instantly. And that will give you a short-term fix. But it's easy to go back to the old habits. You know, it's easy to go back to Sunday night, it's pizza night. So the final chapter, and probably my favorite one, actually, says, now you've got all these techniques, how do you embed new habits? How does this become the norm? You know, when I was 30, I used to weigh um, 20 stone. What's that in pounds? About 280 pounds. Um, now I weigh about 200. So I lost about a third of my body weight. And when people see me now, they find it almost unbelievable that I used to weigh so much. But when I used to weigh a lot, people would find it unbelievable I could lose weight. It was just a question of changing habits. So a lot of the techniques and methods I learned as I went through that process, you can apply to business as well. So it's very short, very pithy, very clear final chapter that just helps people make a long-term sustainable change rather than read the book, use it once, and then just go back. So I hope that sort of answers your question, Wade. Is there anything you want to particularly ask about what I've said? 
No, actually, you did a fantastic job. And and the next question that we're going to ask is for you to break it down one step further. And in, in that, you know, if the reader could only take away one concept, principle or action item of your entire book, everything that you just took uh, the time to tell us in the last couple of minutes and break it down for us, uh, what would you want that to be? It would be to be a peer of the person you're talking to, be an equal of the person you're talking to. In other words, you're a top dog too. So it's important always that you come across as their equal. So just this morning, so as we talk now, this is evening UK time. I was talking to a potential customer today um, and she said, we really want to work with you, Andy. We just need to go back and make sure we've got some budget." Now, that's a perfectly reasonable thing for a potential customer to say. But what then happens is if I say, yes, thanks, off you go, in effect, the power is left with her. So I said this. I said, okay, that's great. Thank you for checking that. But I actually think there's two things that are important. Yes, we've got your budget, but also we have my capacity because I'm really busy too. So how about this? Why don't you go and check budget? I'll go and check capacity for the deadlines you're talking about. And we can circle back in the next couple of days just to see how aligned we are with this. And so it's only a simple change. But what it does is it helps us be peers. And at the end of a meeting, I don't say I'm conscious of your time. I say I'm conscious of time here. Why don't we do this as next steps? I'll do this, this, this. But could I suggest that you do that, that, that? And all the way it's equal. And what happens is these top dogs, they want someone useful. They want someone valuable. They want someone who's a peer of theirs. They don't necessarily want someone who's deferential and subservient. So very short answer to your question is to succeed with important people, become a peer of them. Now, that was quote worthy right there. And that's, that leads into our next question, which is, do you have a favorite quote from your book? And will you take a minute to explain what it means to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's interesting. Um, there's there's a number of quotes in here. One of them I've discussed briefly before about afters. Nobody cares what you do. They care what you cause. So I don't want someone to complete my tax return. I want somebody to cause me to pay less tax. I don't want a website. I want new sales. Nobody's going to buy my book, but they do want to impress and influence everyone they meet. It's like the How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's a great title for a book because it talks about afters of reading the book. So that's one that I like. But another one, because I just found this works very well. Okay, so you know at the beginning of a presentation, this doesn't always work, this script, but it just worked beautifully on this occasion. Um, Richard was called in, and I I, I thought I'd like to quote Richard here because I'm speaking on behalf of both of us because we're both equal partners in this book. Um, And a group of consultants had asked him to introduce um, the sales pitch, which was many, many slides long, very, very boring. And Richard said this to start the presentation to the group of buyers. You've seen our slide deck. You've read our proposal. Proposals and slide packs are necessary but dull. So rather than take you on a death march through materials you've already seen, I'd rather we use this session to focus discussion on what the critical factors are and how we can best work together to make sure we deliver outstanding results. And what I love about that is... It's self-deprecating, you know, the death march idea. I love the idea it's important, but they're dull. But I just love what he does is straight away, he's become the top dog in that meeting. Not more important than the people he's talking to, but definitely the peer. And so I would urge um, entrepreneurs listening, whether you get the book or not, always work out in advance scripts that you're going to say to situations you know you're going to face. You know, there's only so often you can be surprised when someone says they don't have budget. There's only so often you can be surprised when someone says they don't have time for this. But if you don't work out your scripts in advance, what will happen, Wade, is you tend to habits kick in and you say exactly what you said last time. So the only way to change that is use is use pre-prepared scripts, which you practiced. Now, the book has loads of scripts like that, which if you like that one, happy days. If you don't, write another one, but know in advance what you'll say. But I think in the book, probably we've got 40 or 50 different scripts for different situations mm. that people can use straight away just like that one. Andy, thank you for sharing both of those. And we'll put those in the show notes at the elpodcast.com. So for those that are mobile right now, out driving, walking, running, doing whatever they may be, uh, they can go back and access those, think on those a little bit deeper. And Andy, this next question, 
It's really our final one, and it's asking uh, not for any book recommendation, but I like to say the book recommendation. So if there's only one book you could suggest based on the way that it's changed your life, created a paradigm shift or a lifestyle shift, what book would you recommend? Um, It would be um, a book by Fred Lee, um, L-E-E, called If Disney Run Your Hospital. Um, it is the best book I have read by, I don't want to exaggerate here, 10 million miles, you know, on um, customer service. So this gentleman, Mr. Lee, had worked in hospitals all his life. He worked for Disney for a bit and then went back to hospitals. And he found that a lot of the wonderful things that Disney do for customer service, you could actually transfer back to a hospital. But the reason that hospitals weren't aware of this, again, is because of the habits they're in so it's like you know when you go certainly in the uk if you go in to see an ill relative um when the nurses have got staff changeover if you say how's my ill relative doing they often say i'll tell you in a minute we're just doing staff changeover now that is cultural it's endemic it's habitual but it's definitely not obligatory they don't have to do it and he said well going into disney just opened his eyes that someone at disney would always find the time and he makes the point in his book but Time is, I mean, I'm paraphrasing him here, but the way I say this is time is never about time. Time is about priority. You know, you've always got time to do something if you think it's important. Um, It's a bit like you hear people say they moved house six months ago and they've not had a chance to empty all the crates yet, the boxes. They have, however, played Call of Duty for six hours over the weekend. And you say, that's just it. Like, time's not about time. It's about priority. If you thought it was important to empty the boxes, you would have done it. And the thing I loved about this Fred Lee book, If Disney Ran Your Hospital, is if you prioritize the right things, you can change your customers and therefore your lives very, very easily. I love it. It's a great book. Mm. Thank you for that recommendation. That's actually the first time it's been suggested uh, here on the EL. So so I always appreciate learning about new books. And, and, And Andy, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also get information on your book, Top Dog? Sure. So the book is easy. It's um, on um, Amazon.com. We're very pleased when we launched it in the UK. It went straight to number one in the charts. It was actually their number one book on communications for a couple of weeks. So that was cool. So you'll find it on Amazon. Um, Of course, if you want to come through to my website um, and and ask me any questions about what we talked about today or about the content, I always reply to any email I get. You know, I love talking to people who like my stuff. Why wouldn't I? Um, That's just andybounds.com. And the other thing, Wade, um, is a lot of people like to learn by reading, but also a lot of people like to learn by video. And I have um, an online video club where members um, get videos of me giving advice um, so the first month we talk about how to sell. The next month is how to communicate. So there are no more boring meetings at work. The third month is how to network. So you can actually work around quickly and get contacts from it. We talk about presentations and referrals and so on. So if people want my advice by video, um, they can have a look for that on andyboundsonline.com. Uh, I'm very proud of that, andyboundsonline.com, because busy entrepreneurs don't want to wade through massive things sometimes. And all these videos are five, six, seven minutes long. You get about an hour, hour's worth every month, and it just gives short, useful things that you can use instantly the minute the video finishes. So they're the three ways. Amazon for the book, andybounds.com, my website, to contact me, and also andybounsonline.com if you want to find out more about the videos. Excellent. Andy, th- there was a lot of things that you just recommended there. So we will put those in the show notes as well. So people have easy access to all of that, uh, all of that content and those links and such. And Andy, more than anything, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us. I've enjoyed it, Wade. Thank you. Thanks again for listening in today. If you'd like more information on Andy or his book, Top Dog, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. And as always, if you'd like an opportunity to win his book, check out the elpodcast.com and become a VIP. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.